I'm glad that you've taken time to come and worship with us. We consider it an honor and a privilege. Um, today we have some, some celebrations. We're, we're about to baptize five people. Um, and so in a few minutes, Jim, some of you are family here to celebrate that. Thank you, family, for coming to be a part of that. We are also going to be taking up the Lord's Supper today and just a wonderful, wonderful worshipful activities to do together. So... Um, just because they're not out there yet. I'm, I'm going to have to go get changed. I'm going to join them in a minute. But, but when they come, smile for them, okay? But when they get done, clap for them. Because just as, as nervous as maybe you were that first time, they are too. And we love them and agree with their statement of faith. I have just five, five quick things to remind you about. The first one is, is that right over here, we have a quilt. This is for Miss Joyce Oliver. Miss Joyce Oliver, if I remember correctly, the first female uh, sheriff's officer in town. Is that right? Yeah, Miss, Miss Joyce. Such a sweet, kind, a member of our fellowship and congregation for many, many years. She's homebound, probably is a good description for that. We're just joining and praying for her. Um, and so let's pause. While I'm praying, you pray for Miss Joyce. Pray for her help. Pray for good fellowship with her. Okay? Heavenly Father, we pray that today Miss Joyce might know your presence in a real and special way, that you'll continue to give her good health, a clear mind, and a strong body. Father, bless her family as they watch after her, and I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, so we have a move, children, children, children of all ages, but you guys. You have a movie night coming up? It is on March the 2nd. What are we watching? Sing. We're going to watch Sing. We're going to, we're going to sing too. That's a great movie. Uh, so we're going to watch Sing. You're invited to come and be a part of that. Young people, your camp uh, information is located in the bulletin. So if you're a youth or parent of a youth, watch out for that camp information that's in the bulletin right now. Um, we are also, this is um, the end of February, we are taking up toothbrushes and toothbrush covers for Operation Christmas Child. So please, we, we free you and invite you to pick up lots of toothbrushes, lots of tooth, toothbrush covers. It, it just doesn't sound right to say that in its plural form, does it? <laughs> but I invite you to go and pick those up, bring them to the church. Um, and this is also, uh, number five, the month that we celebrate the WMU, um, its ministry. We remember a few Sundays ago, we had a, a WMU-led worship time. And um, with all of that going on, we have um, the Heck Jones offering being taken right now. So if you would like to give to help support our RAs, our GAs, our ladies ministries, uh, both at our church and around the state, I encourage you to give today to the Heck Jones offering. So I'm going to pray. I'm going to bless you guys. We're going to worship. And, and while I'm doing that, y'all be thinking about those that we're about to make a statement of faith together. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our opportunity to gather in your house this morning for worship, for our hearts being stirred. We give you all of our minds, attention, and affection. Father, we pray that through today that your Son and your name would be glorified. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And I wanted to take just a few moments to speak, uh, especially for our children that are here to participate in baptism together, um, that guys, th there's nothing really special about the water this morning, other than it's nice and warm. <laughs> what makes today special is the statement of faith from these who come saying that Jesus Christ is their Lord and Savior. And this is an outward expression of what God has already done on the inside of them. They are saved in Jesus' name. And so we celebrate with them that, that just like we too were once lost, we celebrate that Jesus Christ was, was uh, buried and, and crucified and risen again. We celebrate this with them. So first up today is Ms. Haley Matthews. There you go. Oh, isn't it nice and warm? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we're going to switch hands. All right. I need this hand over here. There you go. 
by your own statement of belief, Haley, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Sean, Sean Robbins, he's coming down the steps right now. But yeah, you're in a good spot. You can keep looking that way, or you can look at me. But you can look out there too. <laughs> I baptize you because of your own statement of belief that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right. Cody, to be fair, I, I went to talk to him beforehand just to make sure I got the names right. These are two fine young men who have joined our congregation. Amen? Amen. Are you ready? All right. Then again, by your own statement of faith that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, I baptize you, my brother. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, uh, when you're ready, Miss Peggy West is coming down right now. And we celebrate with both of them and joining our congregation being baptized as a part of our faith. And I've got a special guest up here as well. Um, you may never see him just because of the way the walls are this morning. Um, Derek Vaughn is up here with me to help baptize them in safety. And she's, she's giving a sigh of relief that the water's warm as well. <laughs> All right. Now... Your family is right there in the middle, I think. There they are. Hey. <laughs> so, I want you to take one more step forward. There you go. By your own statement of belief, because you are a believer in Jesus Christ. Amen. I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thank you. Just for safety's sake, we're going to let Derek help her get up to the other side for a second. And while she's doing that, I have the opportunity. If you don't know Mr. Dick and Miss Peggy, they have been attending with us for a while, um, but they come from, from some different traditions and, and faith backgrounds, from Methodist and, and Presbyterian, those type of faith backgrounds. And, in joining us, they have been so willing and so excited to be baptized. We've actually been talking about this since probably last November. And they came to me and said, we want to do this. We believe in Jesus Christ. We want to make, make an outward uh, uh, sign, expression of what we believe in him. So Mr. Dick is right here again. He's so excited that the water's warm too. <laughs> That's great. You're in a perfect spot. So, Mr. Dick, I baptize you because of your own statement of faith in Christ Jesus as your Lord and Savior, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It is exciting. It is something that we celebrate. And we did this on time, planning it for this day. But in a few weeks, on April the 10th, we're going to start to baptize again. And just like they made a statement, just like they um, are doing something out loud, maybe on that day it will be your turn to be baptized in the precious name of Jesus Christ because He's your Lord and Savior. Please pray with me. 
Our gracious, good, and loving Heavenly Father, our hearts are overflowing with joy. That's what you do. You fill us not just a little bit, but you fill us. You lavish things on us. You give out of your abundance of who you are, your, your good, your love. And you cover us with the blood of Jesus so that we can come before your very throne. We can come confidently. We can come and we can praise you. And we can bring our requests to you and cast our cares on you because you care for us. Father, we're, we're just rejoicing with these precious souls that have followed in obedience in baptism and making that outward profession of faith and um, of, of following the example of Jesus in doing that and, and having that symbolism of being washed clean and our sins forgiven and, and cast as far as the east is from the west. God, that's just absolutely so amazing to think about. We just can't even wrap our brains around that. How you do that. How much you love us. Father, I just pray that you would help these precious folks as they continue on their journey with you. That they would walk with you. That they would learn the unforced rhythms of grace. That they will learn walking with you, Jesus. Help us as their church family to surround them and support them and encourage them and be mentors to them and to love them. Lord, your word says that that's how people will know that we are your disciples, is how we love one another. So, Lord, help us to do that, to, to extend the love and the grace and the mercy that you give to us and let that just splash out on everybody around us. We are so thankful for this opportunity to meet in your name, to gather as your children, and to worship you. For you alone are worthy. We love you, and we praise you, and we thank you. In the precious name of Jesus, amen. Well, I'm glad to be with you. If you have your Bibles, let's open them together. We're going to do something unique uh, for the next few minutes together. And we're going to be looking at several passages of Scripture. Okay, so we're going to have them on the screen, but, but we're setting up a premise to talk about family for the next several weeks. In fact, today's uh, the, the title for the sermon series is called We Are Family. Do you remember the song? Well, how, how does it go? We Are Family. Well, Y'all don't remember the song? This is from before my generation. Come on, guys. Come on, everybody. And sisters and me. Thank you. Thank you. We are family. And it talks about the close connection that we get to have because of family. Family is important. Family is so important. And so we're, we're going to set up a, a beginning idea about what family is um, today. Uh, my dad uh, used to keep in his office a sign. And maybe you've You've heard of a sign like this. It says, number one, dad is always right. And then it says, under number two, uh, what, what was, oh, excuse me, for all other rules, please see rule number one. Have you ever seen a sign like that before? Uh, dad is always right, but under number two, for all other rules, please see rule number one. Now, that's not because I'm not speaking on this on my behalf. Today is actually not about church authority or pastoral authority. Today is about the, that Christ has something to say. That God has a plan. He has a design, a designation. And, and, and we're talking about things that, that um, we're not relying on culture to define. We're, we're not relying on tradition to define. Uh, what we're going to look at are some things in Scripture to see how God designed family. Genesis chapter 1 verses 26 and 27 is where we'll begin and then we're going to flip over to Genesis chapter 2 um, and, and kind of go from there. Then God said, then God said, and, and normally we stand up, but I don't want you to stand up five times today. Okay. Let us make man in our own, in our image, in our likeness, 
Let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over the uh, excuse me, all the uh, over all the earth and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. And in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. This is just the beginning. What we're going to say for this and for every other passage that we read today, may God bless his word, his instruction. And today we're going to take a step, a step of faith and take it as it is today. Amen. So the beginning of the passage is, is really unique here. OK, let us make God in our image. Let us. Now, this is referring to the triune God. Do you remember the triune God? God, the father, God, the God, the. Now, I just baptized in the name of God, the God, the God, the. Now, we believe our God to be both singular and plural. He's, he's not plural as in different. He's plural as in distinct. And, and we get the begin, beginning formulation. I have to refer to this because there's three important things about the Trinity that you need to understand that we're going to carry over into the family. The first one is that the Trinity has this interdependence. They're not alone. They're together. They're interdependent. But they're also in relationship with one another, not just regular relationship. They're in total unity. They're interdependent and they're in total unity. They always agree. They never disagree. What one says, they all say. Do you get the idea? They're in relationship. They're also in unity. The third thing we need to understand is they're also in submission to each other. Submission is such a big deal. and It's hard for us today. It's submission we struggle with, but submission the Trinity doesn't struggle with because since they're in perfect unity, they can also perfectly submit to each other all the time. It, let us make man in our image. And this is, man, it's just so, it's so pregnant with beautiful imagery. We are created in the image of a triune God. Just like they're in perfect relationship, perfect interdependence, perfect submission, Perfect unity with one another. Some of that image is bestowed on each one of us. Some of that image was bestowed on Adam and Eve when they were first created. Now, I do want to be correct here and remind you that part of this image also refers to the dominion that mankind is given over the earth. That's kind of seen throughout Genesis 1 and 2, but we're not really looking at that today. What we're looking at today is that there is an image of a triune God that's been given to you. And he says, our image and our likeness, let them rule or have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all. Well, you get the idea. And, and then the next verse. So God created man. Now we're back to singular. In his image. The image of God he created them. How? Male and female. In this passage, we see that God created the first building blocks of the family, the husband and the wife. And the husband and the wife share in the design of the Trinity for relationship, for the desire for unity and for submission. So just as God designed uh, the family, the building blocks to be husband and wife, he also designed us to share in the similar community and relationship as the Holy Spirit, as God, the father, God, the son. The Trinity. He didn't leave the designation to us. He is very clear here. Clear, gentlemen, that you were created on purpose by design. Male. Ladies, that you were created on purpose by design. Female. And in that purpose, we see the foundation blocks, the very beginnings of what it means to have a family. But I want to—I need to carry this just a little bit further. Because this is really just a surface level idea. In Genesis chapter 2. So if you want to flip your Bibles over one page. Um, or one chapter. It is the Lord God said. It is not good for man to be alone. In Genesis chapter 1. 
we see a very day-to-day, orderly, systematic view of the creation account. In Genesis chapter 2, we see a narrative. It's a story being told. And in this story, part of the story of Genesis chapter 1, the Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. Of all the things in all of the garden, everything that God said He created was good. Do you remember that? I created light. He created light. It was good. He created the, 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 the waters, the mountains, the seas, the animals, the plants, and it was all good. This is the only negative statement in all of the creation account, and it was that men, it was not good that we be alone. There's another wonderful word here. It's not just alone, it's separate. It's the idea of togetherness. We were created for community. Created for community with our fellow brothers and sisters? Yes. I will make, for, I will make a helper suitable for him. Because in some way, gentlemen, I know we're going to struggle with this one. Are you ready? I know, gentlemen, that we think that we're perfect. But in some ways, we needed help. He created a helper for us. And ladies, thank you. I'm not assuming that you're perfect. But I am thankful for the help that we get. I'm going to use another word here, and it's going to be really big. It's called complementary. Okay? We see in the design for family that, that God created us in a similar image to the community of the Trinity. And also that the building blocks at the very beginning are, are mother, excuse me, are, are, are male and female. And now, and now we get here that it was a complementary relationship that in some way that there was a gap left that the other fulfilled. Now, I can tell you from great experience, I have a large gap. And it was when I acknowledged the gap that my love for my spouse grew even more. This is a really big deal because of what happens next in Genesis chapter 3, and we're not going to turn there. But do you remember the the part of Genesis chapter 3 where where Satan entered the garden, this perfect creation. Everything's good. Everything's even good now because God created a, super help, a suitable helper for man. And then Satan came into the garden in the form of something. What, what did Satan come in the form of? A snake. Now, I don't know about you, but to, I, I have a disdain for snakes. You, you know that saying, there, there's, there's um, only one... You know, I was about to get it wrong. There's only one good thing... There's no such thing as a good snake. Uh, Anyways, you probably got your own snake saying. But before this moment, before this moment, I don't believe that the serpent was used for anything bad. The serpent was at peace in the garden. It came forth now to be used by the devil in form of a snake, a serpent. And it came to tempt Eve, Adam and Eve. They were in perfect unity until this time. They were in a great relationship. They were together. And then the serpent tempts Eve. Do you remember the temptation? Did God really say? We, we've talked about that for several weeks. Did God really say that you shouldn't eat of that tree? And so she was tempted. She took her own choice. Led uh, In some way, Adam joined her. And then they ate of a tree that God told them not to eat after. We call that sin. It's disobedience. That we're gonna, if you were to read all of Genesis chapter 3, what it, what it required for them was separation from God and they were thrown out of the garden. But God, after they ate of the tree, was walking around the garden and, and calling out for Adam and Eve. Now, can you imagine that relationship today? God was in the garden and Adam and Eve got to be in a close relationship with Him. Like, it, it would really do a whole lot for our faith if God were to show up in our gardens, in our households, in our relationships. Actually, not theoretically, not spiritually. Actually. God showed up. Do you remember what Adam said? It was her fault. Division. Sin. The community that they had been designed after was broken. The design that God had was now destroyed. Do you remember what Eve said? It's the serpent's fault. 
the design was now broken. I believe that God's design for the family is a complementary relationship between a husband and wife as they live together to glorify God. There's families right now that are made of a husband and wife. And, but in just a few minutes, children, young people, and I'm still a child too, we're going to explore that avenue for just a second. But I totally believe that just looking at these two passages in Genesis, that God designed the family to be a complementary relationship between a husband and wife, that it's supposed to last forever, and that it's supposed to glorify God. Now, some of our relationships, husbands and wives, right now may not be glorifying God. That's what today's for. That's what these next several weeks are for. That we get our families in order with the design that God has for us to live in community with each other and in community with Him. There is this old joke, and guys, you remember I'm a horrible joke teller. So we have a promise that if I tell a joke, you're going to laugh. Come on, guys. If I tell a joke, you're going to laugh. And so I just want you to, so it's a short joke. It goes like this. No wife ever murdered her husband while doing, his, while doing the dishes. Come on, guys. Let's try that again. Okay. No wife ever murdered her husband while he was doing the dishes. Ah, thank you. Thank you. We're together now. Because... When we compliment one another, when we're living in community, when we're living in relationship, I do believe that we're at our best. We're becoming a part of the design. Husbands, when we compliment our wives. Wives, when we compliment our husbands. Now, we get in the most trouble when we're not complimentary, but instead divided. You know what I'm talking about. You know what the, the number two leading cause for divorce in America is? Financial disagreements. Number one, sometime along the way, we get tired of our marriage. We're no longer together living in relationship. We're living not in unity, but divided. And we decide to run away to somebody else. That's sin. It's wrong. But I'm thankful today for the precious blood of Jesus Christ that covers every single sin. That for those who have had the heartache of a not permanent relationship or the heartache of a divided marriage or a broken family who've experienced that heartache, let me tell you today that Jesus Christ can fill in that hurt and He can forgive those pains and He can restore what has been broken. But I'm going to ask you today to be countercultural. We're not talking about what laws provide. We're not talking about what tradition and what's okay. Just what does the word of God say? Because guys, I would be really honest with you. I would want for one day for you to have a healthy relationship that's built on more than yourself and built on Jesus Christ and that lasts forever. Because nobody ever comes into my office during those heartacheful times and says, that's the best decision I ever made about Things like divorce and broken relationships and affairs. But what they do get to come and tell me about is, man, my heart's broken. Man, we need to find Jesus Christ together. It's so important that you get this one right. It's so important. But I need to carry on. Thank you for giving me a few minutes to say those pointed words. But in Ephesians, Paul picks up on the design Throughout history, from Genesis now to Ephesians, we're talking about like 34, 35, 39 A.D. Okay, we're talking years and years and years that have passed from this experience. Paul picks up on the design. And he starts with wives. Wives, submit your, excuse me, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now, I just want to stop right there just, just for a moment because I don't want to highlight wives because I need to, I'm need going to step way out there. I feel really uncomfortable because I'm a man telling you this. But it's found in the Word of God. Wives, your calling in the design that Paul points out is to submit to your husbands. 
And you would say to me, but Daniel, what happens when my husband's not being someone that I should submit to? I'm with you. And those are heartbreaking times. I'm just asking for us to look at the design. Wives, when you submit to your husbands, you are mirroring the relationship of Jesus Christ and his church. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives submit to their husbands. What we're seeing here is a mirror, um, a, a reflection. We, we, the church is a reflection of a marriage relationship or the marriage ref- relationship or a reflection of the church. And just as we church are supposed to live in a relationship with our Heavenly Father, with Jesus Christ, just as we church are supposed to submit to our head, our Heavenly Father. Now, gentlemen, I'll say one point in comment to you about submission. Somebody else once said to me years ago, all right, and she said to me, Pastor Daniel, I would find it so much easier to submit to my husband if he was being somebody worthy of submitting to. Now, gentlemen, it does behoove for us that we pursue Jesus Christ, a loving relationship with Him, that we keep our relationship with Him square, straight, to the best of our ability, because when we do, we're pouring grace over our family and over our spouse, and we're sharing in the mirror of the church over them. Now, now gentlemen, we have a part to play. Ladies, I, I do want to be specific here. Of this entire passage, there's something called a, an imperative, a command. Verse 22 is actually not a command. It's more like a proverb. Ladies, when we submit to our husbands, it goes better with our families. It's kind of like a, a proverb. But I want you to take it as if it's the word of God. But gentlemen, this is an imperative. This is the command. Gentlemen, love your wives. And there's no qualification put on that. There's no ending determinant. There's no end. So gentlemen, as you're growing and thinking about the qualification, what is the qualification of loving your wives? It's the same qualification that Christ has for His church. And how did Christ love His church, brothers and sisters? Enough to die on the cross, to be resurrected from the grave, so that we might have eternal life. So gentlemen, our love should be expressed in the same way. Our love should first be sacrificial. Sacrificial. That we're willing willing to lay down our lives, our rights, our attitudes, sometimes our masculinity. We're supposed to be loving sacrificially just like Jesus. And just like Jesus was submissive to His Father, our love should be submissive as well. We should be able to conform to the grooves that make a relationship healthy and not rigid and reject it. Love should be submissive and gluing one another together and accepting what is on the other side. But not only should love be submissive, gentlemen, it should also be sensitive. Gentlemen, love is a sensitive thing. And, and, and it deals with identity. It deals with our identity as men. That, that we have some sensitivity and love for our spouse. Just like the identity of Christ is over His church. Of the church that we're a part of. We're sensitive to her identity. And to who God made her to be. To make her holy. Cleansing her by the washing of with water, with water through the word. And to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain, without wrinkle, or, excuse me, or, or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. And j- kids, I need you to join with me just for a second because I didn't want to leave you out. Wives, we see a design. Husbands, a design starting to form. But children, there's a design for you too. You play a part in this. Husbands, love your wives. Wives, submit to your husbands. Children, obey your parents. Can every parent with me say amen? Thank you. Thank you. Children, I make a joke about that. But in today's world where you're given incredible autonomy, more and more authority, more and more privacy, this verse means so much. Because we're not talking about the world standard now. We're talking about Christ's understanding. 
And you know what's even better about this? There's no age limit on this one, is there? I'm still a child. My, both of my parents are still active parts of my life, and I'm still asked to obey them. Asked is a stretch, because this is an imperative. I'm commanded to obey my parents. Children, we have a design in the family that God gave us, and that design is obedience. And when we fulfill that design, we get to play a part in the glory of God in making a healthy family. But when we're not fulfilling that very design, then the integrity of the family, children, is not what it was. So in these three areas, I just want you to catch on to a phrase that your family that you exist in is not about what you get out of it, but in what you give to it. Have you noticed, gentlemen, there was nothing in this description that talked about what you get out of it? Wives, did you notice it did not talk about what you get out of it? Children, notice that it did not talk about what we get out of it. What it talks about is what we give to it. We're loving. We're submissive. We're obedient. Don't get confused. Family is not about what you get out of it. That's self-centered. That's selfish. That's prideful. And that's dangerous. Because what happens when you don't get out what you want to get out of your relationship? Sometimes we seek escape. Sometimes we get unhappy and want something different. Or we rebel with our words or with our actions. I've been really dreaming about buying something. But I'm probably never going to do it. I've been wanting to buy a side-by-side. Do you know what a side-by-side is? It's a four-wheeler that two people can ride on. It has a steering wheel. You guys know that I like to do things outside. I've been dreaming about buying a side-by-side. And so I got on the Polaris website. Polaris makes one of the most famous side-by-sides. And so I, I got on and started looking at it. Right at the very beginning, right at the very beginning, there is the most dangerous thing on this website. There's a button that lets you build your own. You could put big tires on it. You could put satellite radio. You could put a winch on the front of it. You can put wi- automatic windows that roll up and down. You could put a cage in the back. You can have a two seater, you can have a four seater. You can have big old lights on the front of it to light up the whole field. You can build it like you want it. But that's not the design of our families. When we come into our family with that same mentality, we need to reestablish that Christ builds families. Husbands, He has a design for Wives, He has a design for you. Children, He has a design for us. And when we fulfill that design, we start to strive then for God's ideal of the family. I've been waiting this entire time just to get to this last verse. So thank you so much for being patient. Thank you so much. Um, and unfortunately, I wrote the wrong passage for them to put up there. <laughs> That's my fault, Matthew. That's not yours. The passage in Timothy actually refers to Lois uh, in the second Timothy, chapter, uh, Matthew, actually refers to Timothy's grandparents. And it goes like this. I am reminded of your sincere faith in second Timothy, chapter one, which first lived in your grandmother, Lois, and in your mother, Eunice. And I am persuaded now lives in you also. I've been wanting to get to this passage for the last 20 minutes. Because what we see here is the outcome of a family fulfilling the design. In just this one verse, we see the outcome of a family fulfilling God's design. So Timothy is a missionary. He goes around with Paul. He shares the gospel. He helps to build the church. He's a powerful figure in the New Testament. But Timothy had his faith handed down to him by someone. In this passage, we get to figure out who it was. His grandmother Lois and his mother Eunice. In some way, handed down their faith. Now, this is different than me talking about you handing down your faith. Moms and dads, 
my faith was handed to me by my parents, was handed to me by pillars of faith that went before me, by my grandparents on both sides that loved the Lord and shared it with them. It was generational. But this is only about 15 to 20 years after the death of Christ. There's no generation here. There's, there, there's no long In some way, Eunice, who was still alive, and his mother, excuse me, Lois, and his mother Eunice, who was still alive in the few years since the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, came to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And because they understood that as parents, they had to pass something on to their children. Eunice in some way passed, over, excuse me, Lois in some way passed over to Eunice of faith. And Lois in some way passed over to Timothy of faith. That was so evident that one day Paul was noticing, Paul was noticing the, some dark time in Timothy's life when his faith got to be exhibited. And he was persuaded at that moment that his faith was strong because somebody else gave it to him strong. Because somebody, ate, somebody else gave it to her strong. And so I want to put it just like this. The highest design for the family is to make disciples. Parents, we make disciples of our children. That's our role. We're passing something off. Children, we get to play a part in making the disciples to our family. That we're passing faith off generationally or just between conversion to now. And today we get to celebrate something that's so important. We're talking about passing something on. We're about to take up the Lord's Supper, and this is what we're passing on. A firm conviction that Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose again. A firm faith in Him. A loyal love that lasts and lasts. And so, parents, please feel free during this time to look at your child and say, this is what this means. And parent or husband and wife, don't be afraid to gaze into each other's eyes and remind each other how much together you love Jesus Christ. So I want to invite, well, first, if you have not received an article today, if you would just raise your hands for a minute. Is anybody missing one? Right down here on the front, Mr. Jeffrey. Are there any others? There's some on the left side as well. So they're going to come and bring a couple of articles down for you guys. Just keep your hands up and they'll come and find you. But while they're doing that, I invite the rest of our deacons to come forward to the first two uh, rows right here. So while they're doing that, making sure that the few have those, I invite our deacons to come forward to these first two rows right here. Isn't it good to gather together as family? To worship together as family? To participate and celebrate faith as family. Now, this hits close to my family's home. Uh, as you guys know, I have a wonderful family. But that doesn't mean heartache has escaped us. It doesn't mean that we don't get to seek to come a part of the design over and over again. Just like we all commit to. And just like today, it is our youngest daughter's birthday. And y'all look at her and say, happy birthday, Emma. Happy birthday, Emma. <laughs> she didn't know I was going to do that. Uh, but I am thankful for Emma and the blessing that she is to our family, as you are for the family that you have right around you and with you. Now, Bill, I'm going to ask that you help me out over there, bud, um, because my pants are still sopping wet. Uh, but to help Mark today, for those who were baptized, we have given... Uh, a brand new copy of God's Word that has their name on it. A, a certificate that has uh, today's date and just what happened today. Because we believe and celebrate that our brothers and sisters were baptized in Jesus Christ. So we've got Haley Matthews. And then we've got, who's next down there? Cody. Cody, come, come over to this side though so she don't have to walk so far. Sean, you can follow. Because I imagine Sean is right after Cody's. Right. We're so proud of all of you and your statements of faith and how you grow in Jesus Christ. We encourage you to continue doing so. We also have one for Mr. Dick and Miss Peggy. There they are right there. So Bill, if y'all will. Can we 
we do, it is exciting. Can, can we applaud for them? Can we applaud for Jesus Christ who did save them and us? I mean, thank you, Lord. Now, I know that you may want to say something. Congratulations, how proud you are of them. Um, I'm not going to go stand outside. No, I'm going to stand in the front if you'd like to come talk with me. But I pray that God will bless you. Mr. Donald is going to lead us in benediction. You know, one other great thing about being part of a family is that when we mess up, we can give each other grace. And that's the great thing about Christ. And as his sons and daughters, be there for each other. Be a family. Heavenly Father, teach our hearts that you are our Father and that we are brothers and sisters in your name. Guide us to be loving, caring, and unjudgmental. And may your blessings be upon this family and that it grows abundantly. In Christ's name, amen. Amen.